Hello and welcome to this first class on special relativity. My name is Vikram Rantala and I'm a theoretical physicist in the Department of Physics at IIT Bombay. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were two big discoveries that completely upended our view of physics as had been given to us by Newton. These two main discoveries were the theory of special relativity and the theory of quantum mechanics. These two ideas have completely transformed our understanding of the universe, our understanding of what physical reality is, and even the basic concepts of space and time. So let's begin by first discussing what we mean by special relativity. Relativity very simply means it's the relative relationship between how different observers view the world. And special implies that you're talking about a special class of observers, and these are observers who are in a state of uniform motion relative to each other. That is, they're moving at constant velocity with respect to each other. And these observers are what we call inertial observers. We'll discuss these ideas in more detail as we go along. So today, we're going to discuss three things. Uh, we will discuss dictionaries for physical observers. That is, how different observers translate ideas of physics between themselves. In particular, we'll talk about the ideas of Galilean relativity that all of you are probably used to. And uh, we will discuss how different observers in a state of uniform motion relative to each other translate different observations. We'll then see that physical laws, like Newton's laws, actually obey this principle of Galilean relativity. And that is why it seems so intuitive to us. So let's begin by discussing uh, the ideas of dictionaries for physical observers. We'll start by first talking about how a particular physical observer makes observations. So in order to talk about things in the world around us, we first start by, let's say, talking about particles. Okay, so suppose we have a collection of particles of different types, perhaps. And we want to describe simple things like what are their positions? What are the speeds at which they're moving? And then we can talk about more complicated things once we can describe their positions and their speeds. And we need to describe their positions at speeds at different instants of time. So in order to establish their positions uh, and speeds, we first need to establish a coordinate system. So how do we establish a coordinate system? Well, we start by defining an origin. So we define an origin. And then we define several coordinate axes. So since we live in three spatial dimensions, we define an x direction, we define an orthogonal uh, y direction, and a, a third orthogonal z direction. And now that we have a set of axes, we can talk about the positions of different particles. And the way we do this is we simply drop perpendiculars from the particle's position onto different planes. So for example, if I want to know the Z coordinate of this particle over here, I would simply look at uh, the perpendicular dropped from this particle to the XY plane. And this length over here would give me the Z coordinate. Now, in order to describe the length, I need to have a standard reference length with which I choose to describe it. So what I need to do is then assign some distance on the x-axis as a distance of one meter. Let's say I place a meter stick along this, and now I have a fixed reference length, okay? So now if I want to describe the z-coordinate of this particle, what I would do is see how many meter sticks I need to place together and take the readings on this meter stick at this position. And so I would say perhaps that this is one meter stick, 
two meter sticks and maybe half a meter stick more. So the Z coordinate of this particle is 2.5 meters. So similarly, I can get uh, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. For the X coordinate, I would drop a perpendicular onto the YZ plane, measure how many meter sticks across I have to go to get this coordinate, uh, to get uh, to this point. Okay, and I would say that that is the X coordinate. And similarly for the Y coordinate. So at the end of this, I would have three coordinates to describe this particle. I would have an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and a Z coordinate. So let's recap the essential things that we needed to describe the coordinates of this particle. We need an origin of coordinates. We need a set of reference axes. And we also need a standard ruler or meter stick with respect to which we can measure distances. Okay. Now, uh, we can use this to describe the coordinates of any single particle or set of particles. So if we have a collection of particles, we would have the positions for each particle. So there would be triplets, x1, y1, z1, describing the coordinates of one particle, another set describing the coordinates of a second particle, and so on. Okay, and you just could describe all their positions. However, the world is interesting because of dynamics, because these coordinates change with time. And that is how we can describe things like velocities and accelerations and forces and collisions between particles is only if we can take into account the dynamics, how these positions evolve with time. So if we describe every particle's position by a vector, so let's call this the vector x1 bar, okay, which denotes the position, the vector position of the particle, which has in our coordinate system has these three coordinates. X, uh, and this is the position of particle x2, which is x2 bar. And this is uh, the coordinate of the particle at a particular time, t. And now we can describe the coordinates of every particle at every instant of time. So this vector x1 bar is a function of time. The vector x2 bar is a function of time, and so on. Okay. There is no physics in this. We, this is just a description of the world, okay, or of the uh, of the coordinates of the world, okay. So it's an assignment of coordinates. By the way, one implicit thing here is that we also need to pick an origin in time with respect to which we measure time intervals. So we, uh, we want to choose a zero instant, that is what is our reference time. So, so we start all our clocks at a time zero and uh, we wait. So our clocks, let's say start at 12 noon And then we wait some amount of time, and let's say some amount of time has passed, and the clock now shows 12.15. Okay, so this is our t is equal to zero moment, and this is t is 15 minutes later. Okay, so this defines our origin in time. Okay, we chose a particular reference point. This reference point could have been arbitrary, of course, we could have chosen 1 p.m. or 1 p.m. 
uh, and 13 seconds as our reference time. That choice is completely arbitrary. Okay, Just as when we chose our spatial coordinates, the choice of origin of coordinates was arbitrary. The choice of set of reference axis was arbitrary. And the standard ruler or meter stick was also arbitrary. Okay, we are measuring things relative to some fixed length. Okay, but what that size of that fixed length is could vary. We could have chosen a two meter stick as our reference length. Okay. Similarly, we have two things that we can choose here. We can choose an origin in time, which is again an arbitrary quantity. And we could also choose an, uh, an interval of time, just like we chose a standard reference length, we choose a standard reference time. Okay. How do we choose our reference times? Well, we choose them based on a natural clock around us. For example, we take the motion of the Earth around the Sun and, we and that defines a one year for us. Okay, and then we define things with respect to intervals of one year. So for example, a day is 1 by 365 of a year, uh, an hour is 1 by 24 of a day, and a second is, uh, or sorry, an hour is 1 by 24 of a day, and a, a minute is 1 by 60th of an hour, and a second is 1 by 60th of a minute. Okay. So the interval of time, of course, choosing even a year, is an arbitrary reference. Okay, we could have chosen any interval of time as our reference, and so we can measure time with respect to seconds, days, years, months, or we could have measured, our reference time could have been three seconds, and we could have measured things relative to how many three second time intervals have passed. So the origin in time and the interval of time are arbitrary, and again, this is a choice of coordinates that we're assigning to time to describe the time location of a particular uh, particle's position, let's say. Okay, so once we have set up these coordinate systems, we can now describe dynamics, okay? So we are now ready to describe dynamics. And the dynamics have to do with, if I take the positions of particles at some instant of time, so I have a collection of particles, where these are different functions of time, but I don't know what these functions of time are. I just know that I can assign a position and a time okay, to where the particle is uh, so I can assign a position to where the particle is at a particular instant of time. But what I really want to know is how does the position of a particle change with time? Or how does the position of any particle in my list change with time? Okay. Once we ask these kind of questions, we are talking about dynamics.